Welcome to Esoteria. My name is Nick Majerison, and on today's show, uh, we're joined by the creator of the world famous comic 2000 AD, Pat Mills. Pat, thanks for joining us on today's show. Um, I'm very excited to talk to you. I've got so many things that we're going to be talking to you uh, about today. Uh, but the first time that I met you was um, in a hotel. Uh, I was interviewing you for a magazine article that ultimately never got published, and it was probably a six hour long interview. And I largely blame you, Pat Mills, for opening me up to the esoteric world and uh, all of the different subjects that we've covered so far on this show. So do you want to tell us a little bit about what you do and how you started 2000 AD, the comic? Okay, um, well, I, I'm a comic writer. I, um, I write for 2000 AD. I write for um, uh, various French uh, comic books as well. And I write science fiction, uh, fantasy, and horror. And um, pursuant to, you know, the kind of thing you, you were interviewing me about is that I, I like things to be based on something real. Now, this is actually a bit of a curse for me because if it's not real, I, I don't believe in it and I can't write it. So I have to draw on reality and that's a really big thing for me. Yeah. So you've been on a journey in your, in your writing because when you started out, you created 2000 AD as a comic for people who've not read it that is uh, run by the green-skinned alien Tharg the Mighty, who's popular with the readership. And uh, you started writing a comic called Slain, alongside pretty much everything else, as far as I'm aware. I mean, you were involved in the, the comic's most famous creation, Judge Dredd, as well. Yeah. Uh, do you want to tell us about where your writing took you and how you started out with that? Um, in the case of Slain or, um, or, or just in comics generally? Give us a general overview of the, the, how you began in 2000 AD and where your writing took you. Um, I wanted to write stories that were real. Now, this is a bit of a problem with science fiction because a lot of science fiction isn't real. Uh, it doesn't have anything uh, firm that it's based upon. Um, so in the case of Judge Dredd, uh, okay, it may be set in the future, but it is making a comment, no matter how obliquely, about um, uh, police oppression today and, and indeed when... Um, um, Judge Dredd came out. It's a satire, really. Mm. Um, and I think that applies in one way or another to, to most of my stories. I get very frustrated if I just write complete fiction. Uh, it has to have a, uh, a reality about it. Um, so elsewhere, I wrote a story called Charlie's War, which is about World War I. And uh, I, I talked at that time to World War I veterans and uh, read everything I could. But you actually reach a point um, when, you're, when you're writing where you actually get fed up um, just getting stuff out of books. Now, it isn't always possible to, to draw on real life, uh, but as far as, I, as far as I can, I do. So I've done a fair bit of traveling to some odd places in the world, and I've met some very odd people, and they are a great source of inspiration for my stories. So some of the stories that you've written are, are incredibly fantastical. I mean, obviously, they're science fiction. Uh, give us an example of something that you've written about that you've found out to be, uh, to be true, that's based in truth. Um, well, th th I mean, in, in, in the case of uh, Slain, for, in for example, um, I started off um, writing some stories about uh, esoteric themes and what you might call the um, ancient astronaut um, theory of uh, UFOs and all the rest of it. Now, I had no background in that direction at all. And um, I, I read a couple of books, the, the classics that uh, many people will be familiar with, uh, The Serious Mystery and The Dark Gods. And the, the Dark Gods is very much about a Lovecraftian view of, um, of aliens or ultra-terrestrials. And uh, the serious mystery suggests that kind of ancient astronaut theory, but not in that von Daniken way, which I think has been quite heavily criticized and debunked. Now, let's just clarify for people who are not aware, the ancient astronaut theory is the idea that we have been visited, but that it happened almost in you know, prehistoric times. Right? Yeah. Do you want to explain a little bit about it for people that don't know about this idea? Yeah, um, I think the serious mystery is, is well worth checking out because um, I think the book's been around since the, the late 70s uh, by Robert Temple, I think. And uh, it goes back to the dawn of civilization and it describes how there are these um, fish-like beings who come out of the, uh, um, 
the sea and uh, teach human beings the basis of civilization. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the very earliest uh, myths or legend, legends, but it's, it's very well detailed. And Robert Temple looks at that and extrapolates from that the idea of, um, uh, you know, that we've, we've been in, our civilization has been influenced by uh, an external force. And is this a fiction book or is this a... No, this is, this is a, this is a non-fiction book uh, uh, by an academic. And that's why I think the serious mystery is, is very well regarded. So when I read that, I thought, okay, this provides a good basis uh, alongside the Dark Gods for uh, my Celtic hero slain, a kind of uh, Conan-esque barbarian, um, to explore what you might call elder gods, dark gods, etc. Mm. Um, and that, if you like, I'd started off with um, a completely, um, you know, just getting it out of books. But as I proceeded, uh, as time went on, uh, I found a real life echo. So, so you started writing um, about human beings being possessed by, uh, by, by gods and, and by uh, underwater creatures. And certainly that's a theme that you look at in modern day slain. Yeah. And ironically, as I mentioned a moment ago, Tharg the Mighty, the, the alien editor of 2000 AD, the green-skinned alien editor, uh, who's quite tyrannical. <laughs> so some, some people believe, I mean, David Icke being the most well-known, uh, believe that this kind of thing actually happens in real life. When you started writing about these things, did you believe that? Um, not when I was, uh, not on those very early slains. It took two, if you like, um, real-life encounters for me to to change my views and you, to think you, well that, that you know there is something in this yeah you had real life encounters what do you mean? well when i say real life encounters um uh, there were two of them and i think uh, they bear out uh, this theory that um if you take an interest in something it will start to take an interest in you now i don't think this just applies to the esoteric and the occult it probably applies to everything is that synchronicity that happens to us all. In That's other words, an occult idea, isn't it? It, it? it is seen as an occult idea, but I think it actually has very widespread manifestations. You know, I could be interested in traveling to Ecuador, and if it's something I'm really passionate about, the chances are I might meet somebody from Ecuador on the, on the railway station. Mm. And we all have those kind of experiences. But specific to this uh, Slane story, very shortly after I had written about these, um, these dark gods, um, two two events happened. One was where um, um, a researcher into, into what you might call the esoteric uh, got in touch with me. And he said, uh, I want to send you this um, account I'm writing. And uh, I was curious. And he sent it in. And it was kind of the, the sort of material that you would get in the serious mystery. Um, it was not publishable because the way he was writing was what I would call very circular. It didn't have a linear construction. Um, but it was fascinating, and he had tremendous insights into um, things like early um, uh, Babylonian civilization. Uh, he was writing about that. He was writing about um, modern psychology. In other words, a complete spectrum of the esoteric. And naturally, I, I was quite excited by what he was writing. Uh, I, I made it very clear to him early on that uh, I, I couldn't help him. In other words, it, it, it couldn't be published. But what was fascinating was he said, well, you're meant to have it anyway. And I thought, what do you mean, meant to have it anyway? So he sent this, um, this document to me in, in, in chunks. And over the course of about um, two years, uh, the document built up. And I kid you not, it was about that high off the ground. In other words, it's a massive document. Um, he was writing it, it was clear because he was driven. Now, now many of us as writers are driven by different things, but this, this seemed a very, very odd thing. And okay, I thought, well, fair enough. You know, it's, it's interesting for me to read. Um, but after a while, I said to him, um, why, 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 you know, why are you writing this? What is this all about? And he said, be patient, you will discover as this goes on. And um, as we got, if you like, towards the end of the document, um, it started to be about UFOs, which he referred to as the ships. And he described them as very beautiful and everything. Now, my first reaction there was very cynical. Um, 
Um, in other words, at that point, you didn't believe in aliens. No, no, no. Right. So, I mean, anybody who's watching this, please don't switch off the TV. I mean, I was, I was like uh, any kind of skeptic. I was saying, you know, this is, as far as I'm concerned, I, I don't know whether it's true or not. Um, but, you know, I've, I've read all the kind of, you know, UFO classics, and I've read all the kind of debunking things, you know, their weather balloons, their low-flying aircraft, etc., cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. and, and I really wanted to keep my feet very, um, very much on the ground. And so I think I was a little bit disappointed when I thought, okay, UFOs. And um, the correspondence continued. And then after a period of time, uh, he said, um, do you want to see them? I thought, yeah, right. Like, you can, you can bring them to order. So he's asking you if you want to see, well, I want to see a them. UFO. Yeah. Pop round for a chat. Well, you know, first of all, <laughs> above everything else, I'm a writer, right? You know, and a bit like a reporter, I will go anywhere for a story. So I'm thinking, OK, um, and it'd be interesting to meet him anyway, uh, because by now, and I felt sad that I couldn't help him. He'd written this colossal document, which was unpublishable, um, and yet it did have quite a lot of um, nuggets of wisdom. You know, uh, it, it was a complete spectrum of, of the esoteric, including one or two original insights of his own, mm -hmm. uh, quite a few, actually, I think. Um, so he takes you to meet a UFO. Where do you meet the UFO? Okay, so he invites me. Uh, I, I live in the south of England, and he invited me up to the, to the Midlands. And he said, well, the only thing is, he said, you, you know, you can, you can write about it, talk about it, but don't give the exact location, which is, uh, I mean, this was some 20 years ago, but obviously I have to, I have to honor that. And um, so I had to stay overnight in his house, and uh, I met his wife, his children, lovely family. And all the time I'm thinking, OK, yeah, this, this is all going to be, you know, there's going to be some explanation as to why they don't turn up. You're still very sceptical at this point. I was extremely sceptical. And um, uh, so he said, well, 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 we'll go up to this particular place um, and we will see them. We will probably see them. And I was thinking, probably, yeah, yeah. In other words, I, I, I'm as sceptical as the next person on mm. these things. And... Um, so, I mean, I imagine that you're, you're going into that experience expecting to see, I don't know, maybe some bloke chuck a frisbee or something. And, Did you see it? Uh, you know, that kind of thing. I, I was I also expecting been a catch. Involved in these yeah, kind of, because yeah. we all, anybody who has not had a UFO experience or, or is, what should we say, very much um, a product of this age, is going to look at this with a certain amount of scepticism and say, where's the catch? Mm. And, uh, and my own family were saying, yeah, yeah, right, you know, so dad's going up to, uh, you know, the Midlands to, to see this. It's all very sceptical. And I said, well, okay, let's see what happens. Mm -hmm. So we went to this particular location uh, near the city and, um, um, and yeah, and we started to see them. They're, 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 that's quite well, a... Okay, no, I know this I need is, to take, take you I through that. This, yeah. I know this is a, a story that's got some, some length to it, and I know mm -hmm. that it's... Uh, it's multifaceted and there's more it than is. one UFO experience involved here. Um, do you want to talk us through the first experience that you told me about the first time that I met you and then maybe after the break we'll go into the other two? Okay, well, there, if you like, um, there were, well, it was, it was one experience but there were like four different, um, there were four different visuals, if you like, on mm -hmm. it. And the first one, Okay, so just to give, set the scene, it's a winter afternoon, um, it's mid-afternoon, it's a clear blue sky. I'm actually cold and a bit bored because we're just hanging around there. There's a group of us mm -hmm. because, um, you know, he had a number of families and friends who, who, who were interested in this. I wouldn't say it was like a, it was almost a cult, if you see what I mean. And um, so the first one comes over and it's a distant light. So my, the skeptic in me immediately comes into, into being and says, um, uh, could that be a, could that be a low flying aircraft? I'm looking at it and thinking, no, there's no body on the thing. It's just a light. Mm. And my second reaction is how disappointing, you know, I've come all this way and okay, oh, I'm all I going to see is just a, a dis you know, okay, maybe it is a UFO, but it's a bit boring, you mm. know? I mean, I, I write science fiction for a living. I'm, I'm expecting Steven Spielberg. Yeah. And so then the third reaction is, uh, and I said something quite stupid, actually. I said, uh, I, I'm trying to rationalize it. So I'm saying, what, what could it be? Uh, and I said, um, you know, uh, maybe it's a hang glider with lights. 
which is complete rubbish. I mean, who on earth goes hang gliding in the Midlands with a light on? I mean, somebody's going to write in now and say they but do. At, but at the time, fear manifests itself, doesn't it, as a desire for a rational explanation? I had to rationalise yeah. it. So, and, and, um, and this gentleman who had introduced me to them said, ah, he said, that's a good one. I haven't heard that one before. So he's used to this? He's used to it. That's interesting. You see, we, we have to rationalise it. In other words, we say, well, was it a weather balloon? Was it but at the end of the day, the experience is, um, yeah, it clearly exists. It clearly isn't a hang glider with lights, but it's a little bit, it's a bit dull, you know? I'm going to hold you there a second. Pat. Okay. We'll get back soon and talk about the other experiences and in more detail the one you're talking about uh, next here on Esoteric. <laughs> Welcome to Esoteria. My name is Nick Richarison, and at the moment we're talking to Pat Mills, the creator of the comic book 2000 AD and the writer of some of possibly the best comics uh, ever written, in my opinion. Uh, Pat, moments ago we were talking to you about your UFO experience, your first UFO experience. You're a skeptic at the time. Uh, you've gone with some people that you know who claim to be able to call UFOs down, uh, and, and you're looking off in the distance, and there's a, a light flashing in the distance, which they're telling you. Uh, is it an extraterrestrial UFO? How, how are you feeling at the time? Um, a bit disappointed because, um, okay, I can't explain it, but it's not that exciting. And when, you, um, you, when you're in the fiction business, you get used to quite dramatic images. Um, so that was the first one. Then two more came over and they came closer. And okay, there's no body to them. It's, it's, there's no way of explaining them as um, uh, whatever the usual explanations for these things are, weather balloons or whatever. It's a very clear winter afternoon, about two, three o'clock, something like that. Um, now, when these second two, they came over and they came closer. And uh, three, the thing when you're observing something, a lot's happening very fast. And I'm absolutely happy with saying that this could be an entirely subjective experience. I wrote it down at the time, repeating it now, it sounds bonkers, and I'm happy with that. In other words, if people say, oh, well, you know, he's a writer, he's got a furtive imagin fertile imagination and a furtive one as well, um, that's okay. Um, I, don't, I don't have a problem with that. But two things struck me. One was, um, I got a kind of like a pleasant feeling. It was a bit like, um, I don't know, it, it was like this thing was sort of, it was like it was, like it was reaching out to me in some way, um, which actually made me feel quite hostile. Uh, you know, in other words, okay, this thing's, com this thing's coming at me, or this, this is a light, but I'm feeling suddenly a little euphoric. Mm. Uh, and I'm a bit of a control freak, so that for me didn't do a lot for me. In other words, I'm not thinking, oh, how wonderful. Now, everyone around me is saying, oh, aren't they beautiful? The ships are here and all this kind of stuff. And I'm thinking, well, I don't know. I I'm quite, sus I'm very suspicious. I'm very grounded. So uh, that was one reaction. The other one, which again, maybe it was my imagination, but I, I don't think it was. I wrote it down at the time. Uh, looking back on it, it seems a bit bonkers. It was almost like, there, were, there was some kind of a, it was almost like an attempt at an aircraft engine or something. Now that of course suggests, oh well, maybe it was an aircraft. It wasn't, you know, the, the, the direction of it, the height and everything else. But okay, you know, it's, it's almost like, it's almost like the thing has got a kind of chameleon effect. And it's worth stressing at this point, it was obvious from everybody else's reactions, the thing, whatever they were seeing was different to what I was seeing. In other words, they're seeing something beautiful. All I'm seeing are some unexplained lights which are coming very close. They don't have a body and they seem to have some kind of, I would say, relatively subjective experience to me. So you're looking at the same thing but you're seeing different things? I think we're seeing something different. Okay, maybe they're true believers, they're seeing what they want to see. Um, but when we got to the last one, it's a different ball game. Well, like you say, there are three experiences in total, aren't there? So the, the second uh, thing that you saw, I mean, what was that? Describe that to us. What what, you mean the final thing or, or just these? The, the, we were just, just basically lights which were coming closer. Mm -hmm. But then when, you got, when we got to, if you like, the final one, yep. that's, that's the payoff. In other words, suddenly I have to be a true believer. 
You okay, know? well, tell us about that. What happened? Okay, so what I see then is this kind of, and, and this is an organic thing. It's organic. It's uh, it's kind of like an embryo, like a like a jellyfish, something like that. It doesn't have um, and you know tra trails or anything, but it's it's a kind of roughly disc-like shape. Uh, it, it's sort of translucent, like a jellyfish or, or almost a f uh, uh, like a, an embryo or something, and it's kind of pulsing across the sky. Now I'm exaggerating how it was pulsing, but the feeling was like that, you know. Right. It, it was that kind of feeling. And I'm thinking... How far away is this... I mean, how far away is this thing from you? Well, you that, that's a difficult thing to judge because, um, you, you know, if you see an aircraft or something in the sky, you, you can roughly judge. Um, it wasn't that far away, let's put it that way. But the scale of the thing, you have no way of judging. If you see a bird or a swan going through the air, you can say, well, it was that far away, whatever. But you, you, you don't know what this thing is. Yeah, you've nothing to reference it. Exactly to so. Before, yeah. And... The thing that, re that my first reaction, of course, was that this sounds a bit, um, what should I say, a, a bit tardy on my part because I'm thinking, oh, it's not the, it's not the Steven Spielberg thing, it's organic. Mm. I'm thinking, well, it's not meant to be organic. Um, you know, why is it organic? Uh, I I'm expecting, you know, real it's not hardware. It's disc, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And although in the back of my mind I was aware that there was uh, a, a book which actually covers such organic source. Uh, that wasn't really uppermost in my mind. I was expecting, they were talking about ships. And this is why, as I say, I think, I think their reaction to the thing was different to mine. They still went on referring to them as the ships and talking about them as beautiful. So now either, um, either that's just a, they're, they're, they're using an inappropriate phrase or they're actually seeing something different to me. And I think it's a mixture of the two. I think there is a subjective experience with UFOs. In other words, um, you, you not, wouldn't say it's you, you see what you want to see, but I think the way they affect us, that they're, they're, they're something we're not, we don't usually see or perhaps even meant to see. So when our minds see them, perhaps we translate them into something uh, that is reasonably plausible. Now, for me, seeing an embryo, as it were, or a jellyfish-type thing uh, pulsing across the sky, uh, I venture to suggest that that could not possibly be something that my mind has uh, made sense of. I, I think it actually has to be what they are. So it's not something you expected to see? What, Absolutely what? not. I, I wanted to see um, close encounters of the third kind, and here I'm seeing something that's impressive. Um, but, but it's like anything that's quite exciting, you actually want more. In other words, you're left asking a lot of questions and, you know, you really want to see it again or, or you want to think, um, you know, where do we go from here? So, so this, I mean, how big was this thing? I'm trying to picture it as hard as possible. I, as far as I could say, uh, I, I would say it was the size, uh, and this is a, a subjective judgment here, mm -hmm. I would say, say it was the size of a large aircraft and it was quite close it right. was quite close. This wasn't some, uh, what should we say, tiny object, uh, whatever, um, and it was moving, and it, it didn't have any kind of effect on me. Um, and as I say, it's a little churlish of me to say I was mildly disappointed with it, because it wasn't what I was expecting to see, mm. you know? Um, what a strange experience, though. So, so, so you have that experience, and at that point you're a writer, and you're writing science fiction, and you're writing about this kind of thing. You've taken an interest in it. It started to take it's an, interest an interest in, in, me, yeah. in you. Mm. So, I mean, how did that affect your work? Because already um, you've been writing about, you know, green-skinned aliens running comics. Uh, you've been writing about <laughs> in Slain. Uh, uh, you know, sort of a Conan the Barbarian figure who's fighting against uh, often creatures that are possessed uh, by an extraterrestrial influence. I mean, does it does it make you believe in that stuff when you saw that, or, or, or were you still a sceptic, or how did it leave you? Well, I couldn't be sceptical anymore. Um, but what I was was, um, I think it's fair to say then and now, I'm kind of a, a little bit hostile um, towards the idea. Um, for, uh, I, I think, uh, um, a couple of reasons. One, because I think people who, who seem to be involved with UFOs, I, I know one or two people, um, they, they, they're often quite damaged by it. Now, whether they're damaged before or after or whether it's interrelated, but it's a quite well-known thing. Mm. I, think, uh, I think viewers who, who have some experience with this would probably agree. Uh, 
Now, of course, it's also almost a way of saying, well, they must be a nut, you know, they, they imagined it or whatever. But they do seem to be damaged by it. I don't think it's actually a very good thing. So I have a natural hostility um, towards, towards the idea. But of course, I'm a writer, I'm curious. So I'm a little bit torn between those two things. And, um, and also I have, um, I have friends who, who have, a, if you like, a, a perspective on this and were able to, to tell me about their perspective. And I was aware of that when I, I was witnessing this experience. In fact, I should add, um, after seeing it, um, you know, the gentleman who, who'd shown me this, he said, uh, he said, next time, he said, um, you know, they'll come even closer, he said, you know. And he actually talked about, you know, interacting with them and everything. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I think I did the right thing. I, I decided not to go back because I don't think it was actually having a great effect on him. Mm -hmm. I don't think it was benefiting him. And I was aware of other people who have actually been damaged by these things uh, and seem to have had uncomfortable experiences. And I thought, okay, I've seen them. Okay, do I want to go back and um, perhaps get a bit more involved in these things? They clearly mess with your head. Well, I've, and I thought, I've I don't said, want that. I've always said I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to see a UFO, you know. I, I have enough problems dealing with reality yeah. as it is uh, without having that <coughs> thrown into my into my world. So I've always avoided any experience like that. Yeah, and, and I think that's why I thought I'm not going to go back. It's a bit chicken on my part because I mean, I'm a writer and I've probably got um, more of a story out of it, but I think, you know, you have to protect yourself and you don't go into it. I think they are a bit dangerous. Um, I, I'm delighted that they exist. Um, Friends of mine have a theory as to how they work approximately in as much as any of us can. And ha being aware of that theory and using it in stories, that's almost enough for me. Because as I say, I'm actually quite hostile to the idea of um, uh, creator gods, actually. You're hostile to the idea of... Yeah, that. I think I think it's a sort of... Um, it's an imposition on who we are as human beings. In other words, somebody's messing around with our DNA or whatever, if that is the case. And, um, you know, I, I think, um, yeah, I, I'm not comfortable with that. Well, I know that's a theory that you've touched on on your work, uh, in your work, and we'll, mm. we'll talk about that some more in the next part. Okay. Uh, the idea that there is an extraterrestrial influence that um, is changing and affecting political events uh, in the world. And uh, before we get into the third part, do you believe that to be the case now? Um, I think, I think there is something. I think that what it, what it, I, I would put it like this: that um, a, a phrase that's often used is ultra terrestrials. In other words, they've always been there. In other words, that this phenomena, this organic phenomena, is one aspect of them. I think they've always been there. They've always messed around with us. So, if that's the case in modern times, there's no different to before. I think it's um, it's a subtle process. Um, if people don't believe in it, that's okay. But uh, I, I think it does have some effect on us. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. And uh, well, well, we'll get to that soon, and we'll get to the uh, the theories that David Icke has, and the, the way that your work kind of ties in with that. Uh, you're watching Esoteria at the moment. And uh, we're talking to Pat Mills, the uh, writer of many brilliant comic books uh, and also the creator of the world-famous comic 2000 AD. Make sure you're with us in the next part. <laughs> Welcome to Esoteria. My name's Nick Wajeris and currently we're joined by Pat Mills, uh, the creator of the comic 2000 AD. Uh, and Pat, we were talking moments ago about how you started off writing about various different themes in 2000 AD many years ago. Uh, and then if you take an interest in something, it takes an interest in you. We just covered the fact that you had a UFO experience, which made you uh, a UFO believer, so to speak. And um, now you're covering work in Slain, uh, which is your, you know, one of your current stories that's running in 2000 AD. Uh, that's been described as Ikean uh, in that it puts forward the idea uh, that some sort of reptilian entity uh, has been directing events uh, for many many years. Do you, want to, do you want to tell us about that and how you got into that idea? Um, yeah, well the, the background first of all was the serious mystery as I mentioned earlier that um, this, this describes some kind of fish-like beings and so forth uh, and it's a, it's a myth, it's a legend but it, um, it's quite a remarkable one and uh, so if you like that was, that was the kickoff point. Secondly, um, 
When I started writing about this stuff uh, some 20 years back, um, uh, some uh, people from a hereditary coven uh, came along and uh, again you take an interest in something it takes an interest in you and they said um, oh you know we're fascinated by what you're writing about because for us uh, th this is part of um, you know something we we happen to believe in so, so for these guys it's a given yeah because they're from a hereditary coven now um, skeptics will say there are no such thing as hereditary covens what is a hereditary well you have a coven right which goes passed down transgenerational Right now, the idea of, uh, um, if you like, the sceptical point of view is that covens are something that's uh, just come up in the last, you know, 100 years or so. You know, they're kind of Alistair Crowley influenced or whatever. And is but a coven a collection of... It's a, co it's a collection of pagans, really, right. uh, pagans, witches, whatever. And, um, and I have no reason to doubt that it is actually transgenerational. And their approach to the whole thing was quite laid back. And uh, for a long time, they didn't really want to talk that much about it. They just said, oh, well, you know, it's, it's nice to know somebody's writing about what they described as the newts, mm -hmm. which, if you like, are ultra-terrestrials uh, who seem to manifest themselves in a, in a variety of ways, um, subjectively, objectively. Um, but they had a catch-all phrase for it. And um, if you like, uh, the way you could identify them was that uh, this is something that messes around with us in one shape or another. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, whether it's reptilian or whether it's fish-like, whether it's uh, UFOs or whatever it is, um, you know, that's, a, that's quite a good catchphrase to, to, to cover it all. And, um, and, and this predated, of course, uh, David Icke's stuff. Well, you see, this is mm. the thing, Pat, because I remember reading uh, a comic strip that I think is grossly underrepresented, called Finn. And uh, in Finn, you were taking these themes, uh, and I, as, as a young chap, was reading uh, about um, newts that were uh, supported by kind of a... Uh, you did a version of sort of a Masonic order yeah. that was supporting them and their network, and then Finn was a witch... Who, who was fighting against them. And those themes, are, like I say, they've been picked up in Slain and developed to the nth degree. But Slain is obviously set in an earlier yeah. period. You, in Slain, one can be a lot more colourful about this material. Material, You can be a lot more dramatic. And, of course, it, it, there's a stronger fantasy element. But it allows one to pursue this kind of thing. Because if you're going to have um, creator gods, uh, which is a, a hallmark of most fantasy, you know, you, you have these kind of alien beings or whatever, they might as well be based on something real. In other words, if I'm going to write about something, I want to believe on it, believe in it to some, some, some degree. So and do, you do you believe that these things are real and that there are extra terrestrial <clears throat> newt lizard creator um, gods? Toilet? I'm not sure. I'm not sure it's as theatrical as the as the version um, that uh, uh, David Icke uh, describes. I think, uh, as I was saying earlier, my UFO experience was, was mildly disappointing. Um, although, in fact, it's still impressive. Um, and I have a feeling whatever it is, 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 is almost a natural phenomenon. They've always been around. There's no, there's no invasion. It's just, just how things are. Mm -hmm. um, and um, on, on a purely personal level, as long as they don't mess with me, I don't want to mess with them. I think... Um, but hang on a minute, though. Aren't you messing with them ever so slightly? Because I don't know <laughs> we've got some of the pictures of Slain. I mean, Slain that's, that's true. actually urinates... <laughs> on on one of these on one of these lizards, you know. Yes, that's good, that's in, a good in point. In a sequence towards the end, I mean, there we go. We can see Slain has, has beaten him. He's lying on the ground, and uh, in the next page, uh, he get, Slain gets his his little man out and and, and, and urinates literally all over uh, the lizard there. So that, you're kind of messing with them a bit. To be uh, yeah, I, I guess that's fair. And I suppose also, I mean, it's a, it's a while since I wrote that, but I think it demonstrates, uh, or is demonstrating to me anyway. Um, yeah, I mean, at the time, I, I think I must have, um, if you'll forgive the pun, been a bit pissed off with, with the idea of, if you like, uh, intruders, you know, people who are messing with our, our consciousness. Now, exactly how they do it and so forth, I don't think anyone has an exact template. I think we're all struggling to define this. There is something out there. There is something... And uh, we've all got our theories of them. Some are more dramatic than others. Some are more theatrical than others. But I think it's all an attempt to describe some phenomena that cannot be dismissed entirely as, you know, either delusions or, or fantasies or, 
you know, um, you know, low flying aircraft, whatever it is. It, 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 we don't have a vocabulary to define it properly. So we lack the language too. I think so. Although ironically, I would say back in, uh, I think it was the 1930s, uh, Charles Fort in a book called The Book of the Damned, uh, just to set the scene here, Charles Fort collected odd accounts. He, he went through every newspaper, I think he was in a New York uh, library, and he went through them all and he collected all these weird stories, which were all authenticated. In other words, the, you know, the, the, the classic ones are flying frogs and all that kind of stuff, but there was a fair number of UFOs. But how he defined it, and I don't think anybody has actually put it better than him. Uh, he said uh, something like this, um, I believe we are property. I believe we belong to something or someone. Um, to them, we are like sheep or cattle. So why don't they communicate with us? Do we, do we have an embassy for sheep? Mm. Uh, do we have a, an ambassador for cattle? He said, but that's how they view us. And just as sheep or cattle probably have a very vague idea of what on earth human, be uh, human beings are, putting them in a field and then eventually taking them off to the slaughterhouse, uh, I think that's roughly, if you like, the ultra-terrestrial's perspective on us. Uh, we, we can hazard guesses, and uh, I think some of them are very theatrical, but I, I think Charles Fort actually put it the very best of, of, of any of us. Essentially reducing us to cattle, being controlled by maybe extraterrestrial or maybe evolved here on this planet. We're property of something, and, and it, uh, the, the chances are if you, you know, you're, you're in a field, um, you know, you, you live out your life and uh, you don't really have, uh, you know, you don't interrelate with it that much and it's not that much of a problem. Um, but imagine if you found a, a, a sheep who'd, who'd written a comic strip about the <laughs> farmer being, being urinated on. Yes, yes, yes that's a good point. being senseless by a muscular barbarian. Yeah. You'd be annoyed with that sheep. Yeah, I, I think that's, I, I suppose that's a fair point. Um, yeah, was that a good idea? Well, I'm still here. I'm not, uh, I don't think I'm behaving in any particularly eccentric way. Mm -hmm. um, so what does that mean? That it doesn't matter, maybe. Um, that's one possibility. Um, my uh, pagan friends claim, and, and I have no way of knowing whether this is true, is it's almost like they say that there are rules on these things. In other words, that there's somehow, you know, some things that happen and... Um, Perhaps it doesn't actually matter. Maybe it's the whole thing. Who cares about what somebody says in a comic book? It's just a bloody comic. But it puts know? into context, doesn't it? That Tharg, the editor uh -huh. of 2000 AD, the green-skinned alien, who I mentioned right at the beginning of the show, uh, a tyrannical green-skinned alien who runs the comic book, and this is before you got into those ideas. It's interesting, isn't it? Well, I, th I think what's interesting is that uh, my, my negativity towards aliens uh, also includes Tharg. I was one of the, I think, three co-creators of Tharg, and I really wish I hadn't. The and, alien uh, they can't, Yeah, they won't get rid of him now, but uh, no, I, I, I think, um, yeah, I'm, I'm actually quite hostile towards uh, Tharg. Um, so obviously, you know, this, this sort of, what should I say, negative view of aliens uh, goes back right to the beginning of 2000 AD. And similarly, as I was describing when I saw these uh, UFOs with other people, and they were all saying, oh, aren't they beautiful? Look, they're here. I'm thinking, beautiful? I don't know. In other words, you know, why don't they sort off? You yeah. know, that, that's my reaction. I'm not sure where that comes from, um, but it's, you, can, you can see from the slain uh, example, it's quite heartfelt. Yeah. So are you a pagan yourself? I mean, I mean yeah. I'm a, I'm yeah a, where, whereabouts do you sound? Like, do you believe in things like magic and the occult and that kind of stuff? Yeah, I'm, um, I, I'm a pagan myself. I'm um, what you might call, um, for, uh, if we're looking for a shorthand way of describing this, I'd describe myself as a Gnostic pagan. In other words, I think the answers are in here. I don't think the answers are in books, whether it is any of the Orthodox uh, religions' books or whether it is, you know, the various uh, Liebers of Alistair Crowley. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as I'm concerned, the answer, you, you believe in yourself. Uh, and that's something I, I have feel with great passion. I'm very um, um, skeptical and, and a little bit hostile towards, um, you know, thinking that the answer is in somebody else's, uh, you know, make your own mind up. Mm, that makes sense to me. Uh, so this is Esoteria, and uh, he's Pat Mills, who like I say, still writes some of the best comics uh, ever written, in my opinion. Uh, one of the few geniuses in the field. 
Uh, this is Issa Tyria, and I want to thank you for joining us on today's show. And I don't know about you, around about this time, I'd quite like to have some Alice D. I'm Alice. Alice D. And I force you to think. I'm Alice. Alice D. The goddess. Spellcasting one, two, three. Alice D. 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 The Bible says, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Gandhi once said, an eye for an eye leaves the whole world blind. He was wrong. Actually, it'll leave one bloke with one eye left over. And everyone concerned would just be annoyed. So perhaps, yeah, so perhaps Gandhi should have said, an eye for an eye leaves the whole world annoyed and most people entirely blind, apart from one bloke who'd have one eye. Add that, add that to another quote. In the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. 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 So, actually, perhaps, perhaps, Gandhi should have said, an eye for an eye leaves the whole world annoyed and most people entirely blind, apart from one bloke who's got one eye and he is the king. If I was him, I imagine I wouldn't bother wearing a crown. You'd only be wearing it for your own benefit. Power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. Hmm. So, perhaps, Gandhi should have said, An eye for an eye leaves the whole world annoyed and most people entirely blind. Apart from one bloke who's got one eye, and he, he's their corrupt king, who probably doesn't bother wearing a crown. No point, really. Messes up your hair. I told all this to a mate of mine, and he, he said... Here's another saying for you, Alice. No one likes a smart ass. So, perhaps Gandhi should have said nothing at all. Saved a lot of confusion. I'm Alice. Alice D. And I love you. It was really scary. It was scary for you. I had to get the doors kept opening on each.